Well, let's get some insight now from William Courtney, who joins us from Washington. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Georgia and Kazakhstan. He also served as a special assistant to the U.S. president for Russia, Ukraine and Eurasia. He's now an adjunct fellow at the Rand Corporation. Welcome to the program, Ambassador. In your extensive experience in the region, do you believe that Russia is planning another attack or invasion of Ukraine? If so, what could that look like and when could it happen? Uh, predicting attack uh, is not something that uh, a prudent statesman does. Uh, certainly, Russia has amassed the force and the kind of force to carry out an extensive attack, uh, a new expanded aggression, if you will, uh, beyond that in 2014 uh, against Ukraine. Uh, most troublesome recently has been the movement of more Russian forces uh, into Belarus, to the north of Ukraine. Uh, earlier, most of the force was on the east and south, and that force could take some time to reach the capital, Kiev. But Russian forces based in Belarus could uh, undertake uh, what some call a thunder run uh, down uh, on both sides of the Dnipro River and uh, capture and circle and capture Kiev. So that's a greater danger. Hmm. Now, at the crux of Russia's concern, uh, the reason why it's massed such a large troop presence around Ukraine is that it's concerned about NATO essentially encircling uh, Russia, and it's demanded that Ukraine uh, be blocked from joining the NATO alliance in the future. Is Russia reasonable in demanding that? Uh, no. No. Uh, NATO certainly is not encircling Russia. NATO faces Russia only in, in the Eastern Front. NATO is a defensive alliance. It's never waged uh, aggression against other countries. The uh, pressure now from the Kremlin, uh, elevating this to a crisis, uh, is a bit uh, hard to understand why it's coming now. Uh, one of the possibilities is that in 2020, large uh, civil society peaceful protests broke out in Belarus. And now the Kremlin may be worried that not only Ukraine could go westward, but so could Belarus. So it's possible that Russia is now trying to bring Ukraine to heel, uh, partly to send a signal to Belarus and partly to stop Ukraine from moving westward. But this, this whole crisis has come out of the blue, if you will. There's been no precipitating reason for the crisis to emerge now. Meanwhile, the European power, the continent's strongest economy, Germany, is facing some criticism. There are reports that some European countries are questioning Germany's uh, reliance or, I guess, reliability in this conflict with Ukraine. We also know that the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline that connects Germany directly to Russia is something that Germany is looking to hold on to. It was initially opposed by the Biden administration, not so much now. What role is Germany playing in this crisis? And do you believe that Germany's reliance on Russian gas is perhaps affecting its response in this situation with Ukraine? Germany is playing a vital role in the alliance. Uh, you'll recall in 2014, when Russia invaded the first time, a lot of people in the West said, oh, uh, Germany has industrial interests in Russia and therefore may not stick with Western sanctions. In fact, now for almost eight years, uh, Germany and all the European countries and the U.S. and Canada have stuck with the sanctions, maintained the consensus. So there's no real doubt that Germany will be strongly opposed to Russian aggression. There is a concern about uh, Nord Stream 2, uh, for example, uh, if energy prices remain quite high in, in Europe uh, and there is an active war going on between Russia and Ukraine spread over a wider front than it has been in eastern Ukraine, then there may be some pressures in Europe to open up Nord Stream 2. This will be a difficult issue for Germany. There is general understanding that you know, Germany's long-term policy of not shipping arms uh, to uh, our conflict areas uh, is not something that's new, that's been around for a long time. There's also been a flurry of diplomatic activity happening uh, behind the scenes. We've had talks in Geneva and now we've got four-way talks that are due to begin in Paris uh, as we speak. Do you think Russia is interested in a diplomatic solution to this standoff? 
Uh, not certainly with regard to the four-way talks in Paris with regard to the eastern Ukraine war that's been going on for uh, seven and a half years. Uh, the Russians have had plenty of opportunity to make uh, progress in those negotiations and never have done that. Uh, one possibility is that Russia is trying to buy time until the Olympics are over. Uh, Putin may not want to uh, upstage his friend Xi Jinping's Olympics, uh, and those end sometime in uh, later uh, February. So it could be that what we're seeing now is an effort by Russia to buy some more time for diplomacy. Up till a week and a half ago, uh, it looked like Russia was saying time for diplomacy was over. And then suddenly, after the Blinken left off meeting, it looked like the Russians wanted to take more time. So I think the Olympics factor may be one of the factors. Uh, but there could be other factors as well. Russia could be getting uh, cold feet, having second thoughts about this. You know, Russia has gone out on a limb, if you will, a little bit like Nikita Khrushchev did in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, out on a limb so far that there's not much room for diplomacy left. Uh, the only choices are really to withdraw or to go forward with aggression. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev withdrew. Uh, and that was humiliating for Soviets two years later. That was one of the reasons why Khrushchev was ousted as premier. Putin may be in a similar situation now, where if he withdraws, this could be uh, difficult for him at home because nationalists would think that he had caved in. But if he launches a war, it would be devastating for Russia's economy, and Russia would be a pariah in Europe. Okay, William uh, Courtney, thank you so much for your analysis. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Ambassador. You're welcome.